I'll never forget what Jake said and this realization I had about organic chemistry. I said to Jake, I'm, I'm so amazed at how simple you make playing the piano look. And he said, well, Neil, I think people probably say the same thing about you and organic chemistry. To you, all these molecules, no matter how complicated they are, they probably look pretty simple to you. And to me, when I look at the piano, it's all just the same small set of keys repeated over and over again. This is lesson number one. It's about learning to play the piano, which is a kind of metaphor for learning the basics of organic chemistry. And that's what Neil Garg, my name is Neil Garg and I'm a chemistry professor at UCLA, is talking about. And this is the aforementioned Jake Boring, a friend of Neil's and a composer who is also playing Twinkle Twinkle Little Star for us. Um, so a major scale would be made up of whole step, whole step, half step, whole step, whole step, whole step, half step. And that's a C major scale, what I just played. There are 88 keys on a piano. Play one at random, and it's just a note, all by itself. Put eight keys together, and you can get do, re, mi, fa, so, la, ti, do. And before you know it, patterns start to emerge. Hey, Jake, can you play us something a little more, I don't know, dramatic? All right, all right, let's see if I can get this right. <clears throat> This is Beethoven's Moonlight Sonata. Within the complexity of the notes, there's simplicity. Do, re, mi, fa, so, and la, ti, do are all there. Even with the simple set of, of keys on the piano, I think the possibilities are endless. There are infinite combinations that you can put together and make any piece of music. And so when we think about organic chemistry, we can start to make similar analogies. So I would just start with the periodic table of elements. It's something that everybody is introduced to at some point in school. Here it is. It's worth more to chemists than all of the pieces of equipment in our laboratories. The most important building block in organic chemistry is carbon. All organic molecules are made of carbon. Carbon is everywhere all around us. It's in this room, uh, we are made of it. Um, we literally couldn't live without it. So even when there are these missions to look for life on other planets, it's often looking for carbon. And then on top of that, there's a few other atoms that are very prevalent in organic molecules. First and foremost would be hydrogen. Others would be the atoms oxygen and nitrogen. And then we start attaching them to one another, right? And that's really the framework for chemical structures. So you can imagine a simple molecule that has one carbon atom. An example would be methane. It's the primary component in natural gas. It's one carbon, four hydrogens, that's it. And then you can get to much, much more complicated structures. where you're changing the number of atoms, the identity of those atoms, and how those atoms are connected. And we can draw these kind of in a two-dimensional way, but it turns out they also exist in three-dimensional spaces. So as you think about the different combinations of atoms, it's almost infinite, or perhaps it is infinite. So just like you can start to learn how to play the piano by understanding a few notes, a few keys, you can start to think about I'd say the beauty and the complexity of organic chemistry by starting with a few atoms, but then it becomes this um, operation of how you put them together. Jake, what do you think? So as, as soon as you get that framework internalized or even under your fingers mechanically, um, it, it unlocks a lot of things. And, and uh, it, it was fun talking to Neil about that because I think maybe he made a connection to organic chemistry, which I know nothing about. <laughs> Great. So, okay. Right, let's, cool. let's, let's play some music. The story of Taxol, a very important drug to treat cancer, is absolutely remarkable. And it starts with an initiative carried out by the National Institutes of Health in the 1960s. The idea was to search for molecules that nature makes that could potentially be used as therapeutics to treat cancer. 
The search is worldwide. Botanists gather leaves and the bark of trees to process and test. Any of these could contain a valuable anti-cancer agent. They found this molecule called Taxol in the Pacific yew tree. It turns out that the tree doesn't quite make enough of it to really make that practically useful for humans. But what scientists ultimately figured out, so the English yew tree, a different tree, makes this molecule called 10-DAB that has a lot of the structural features of Taxol. That chemical can be extracted from the needles and then brought into a laboratory, and then chemists can elaborate 10-DAB and turn it into Taxol using the wonders of organic chemistry. Yeah, this will be super casual, yeah, if that's great. okay. Okay, yeah, so the next one we're gonna do is gonna be done with Amy, and Amy's awesome. And Amy's uh, done a nice job with this. So this is what we call 10-DAB, and that is the material that's extracted from the English yew plant. And then some of that is already placed here in the bottom of this vial, so that's what we're gonna do with the chemical reaction. And the really cool thing that happens here is that this is basically a starting material. It's something that nature makes, but chemistry can be used to then convert that into taxol to treat cancer. And this is what we call semi-synthesis. So nature does a lot of the heavy lifting in this case, makes a lot of the chemical structure. And then we use the wonders of synthetic chemistry to convert what comes from the plant into what's ultimately used as a drug to treat patients all over the world. This is a large number of molecules, 52 quintillion, that will be reacting in this tiny little vial. We won't be able to see a physical change, but it's a pretty remarkable thing what's actually happening at the molecular level. And many other drugs, almost all drugs, are made by synthetic organic chemistry, just like this type of reaction. It's what we do for a living, right? Is we're constantly doing these types of things, but this is all chemistry invented a few decades ago by some very smart people that were not us. We're just replicating that here today. This is lesson three, the final lesson. So far, everything we've seen is based on some kind of law, principle, or rule in science. But that's not to suggest science is always a fixed, unchangeable thing. Right, Professor Garg? So this is something called an anti-Brett olefin. I'm gonna grab a molecular model of this so we can see what this looks like in three dimensions. What you can see here is this, which is called a double bond or an alkene. What's unusual about these types of structures is that it's been thought for about 100 years that it's exceedingly difficult or impossible to make things like this because when you have a double bond like this, it can become twisted as you can even see in this handheld molecular model. But from the research that we've done here, we've shown that in fact, one can make these highly reactive anti-bread olefins despite about 100 years of thinking that would likely suggest otherwise. That's about it for anti-Brett olefins, other than to say there are more chemical structures possible today than there were before Niels and his lab's work. That could mean the creation of the next Taxol. Who knows? It's kind of funny as a professor, you have your material you need to cover in a class and then students start asking these hard questions. You kind of want them to accept what you're saying so you can move on and teach whatever you want to teach. But it's so important that students do that. If I teach a student Brett's rule, I would love for them to say, hey, wait a second, how do you know that? You know, and have that dialogue. I had this chance to go through Los Alamos and national labs and everywhere they have these posters of Oppenheimer and they all say there should be no dogma in science and I'm always reminded, although we need to use these rules to teach students that we also just as much teach them that these are rules based on what we know now. And without you challenging those rules, solving problems, creating things, making new discoveries, we don't advance society. Yeah, I'd like to convey to every student out there don't fear organic chemistry, you got this. But it will take a little bit of willingness 
to learn that new language, but trust that if you can pick up some of the fundamentals, pick up the keys on the piano, the notes in an octave, you have what it takes to learn how to be an organic chemist because guess what? Students are naturally curious and creative and they're absolutely brilliant problem solvers. But certainly do not believe it's hard because I think you can do it. For me, one thing somehow through the video to convey is that that's kind of in the plane, that's in the plane. This means it's a wedge toward you, hash away from you. 3D structure.